Hey guys, so this is going to be for your chapter six story. Before you start this, make sure you have answered all the review questions for chapter five and you have answered the big question. Now, on Tuesday, I put the opening of the big question up on the board. Okay? So that's. And I'm going to leave it up just in case. It's up there. If you need to answer it, the big question, uh, your your beginning sentence is up there, okay? So, anyway, let's go to, I don't know what that just meant. Okay, so we're going to go uh, go, along, go along with your next chapter, which is chapter six, Emperor's Guides and Foreign Invaders, and your vocabulary words. So we have nine vocabulary words or terms that you are going to be looking for as we read. Number one is dominance, which is a state of being more important, successful, or powerful than most or all others. Ambassador, or you'll hear it as ambassadors, is a person sent to represent his or her government in other lands. We have ambassadors in America. Procession. A person sent, no, wait, wrong one. A group of people or vehicles moving together as part of a ceremony. One of the uh, processions that you probably have seen or been part of as part of a funeral procession, procession is when you're following the hearse down the road to the graveside. Appointed is established or chosen in an official way. Elite, most successful, powerful, or wealthy. Resentment is a feeling of displeasure or anger about something unfair. Might is power or force. Contagious, able to be passed between people or animals. And fragile, easily broken. Now, at the very bottom, we have some pronunciations. We have Teltoni, Montezuma, Coco, and Veracruz. How do you like that? said those. All right, so <laughs> let's go ahead and you should have a copy of the story. I make copies of them, so hopefully they'll pass them out. Now, we're going to be reading, let me get out of this, and hopefully the PDF will pop up, and it did. All right, now, So, here we go. Chapter 6, Emperors, Gods, and Foreign Invaders. Here's the big question. What led to the rapid fall of the powerful Aztec Empire? Once again, what led to the powerful fall... I'm sorry, let's start again. What led to the rapid fall of the powerful Aztec Empire? What led to the rapid fall of the powerful Aztec Empire? Okay, so last time we were together, we read about Tenochtitlan, about how it was a great city, about how they had their temples was the heart of the city, and everything else was split up in the districts. Each district had their own school, market, and whatever else they needed. It was very advanced for that time and era. They even had public restrooms. They had sanitation workers who cleaned. So they they were pretty good. So what we're going to read now is about the different emperors they had, the gods they worshipped, and the invaders they came in. So as the city of Tenochtitlan grew, the Aztecs fought for dominance over other city-states in the area. In 1428 CE, Tenochtitlan formed a triple alliance with the cities of Texacoco, and I got to look at the pronunciation. Ha ha. Talcopan. Tal Talcopan. Now, uh, Talcopan in the Valley of Mexico. Now, a triple alliance. Triple means three. So if you're in a triple alliance, that means you are with three people. It was Tenochtitlan, Tal Texcoco, and Talcopan. Okay, so this is your three alliances, and they were in the Valley of Mexico. 
These three cities were alliances or they fought on the same side. They united to conquer neighboring cities. Tenochtitlan quickly became the most powerful city of the three and the most important city in Mesoamerica. Now, as I've said, when you have these rulers who are in these diff a city states, city states are like little city, they're like surrounding the areas. The more land that a emperor possessed, the more power they had. So that is why these two or these three villages or city states together, Tenochtitlan, Texacoco, and Tacopan, they formed this alliance. So they would fight on the same side. And over time, as they kept on gathering more land, Tenochtitlan became the most powerful and it became the most important city in Mesoamerica. The Aztecs had an organized, organized social structure. You have already learned that Aztec families lived in districts called Capulans. Each Capula elected a leader. Together, these leaders formed a city council. Each city council elected its own, one second, Tal, Taltoni, elected its own Taltoni or leader to govern the city. The Taltoni of Tenochtitlan was not only the leader of the city, but the leader of the empire as well. The supreme leader was called the Huey Taltoni, I have to look down, Taltoni, or Great Speaker. He was the emperor or king of the Aztecs. In 1440 CE, Montezuma I became the Huey Taltoni. He expanded the Aztec Empire beyond the Valley of Mexico by constantly raging war. That means he was constantly fighting. And if you look to your left, this is a painting of Montezuma I of what they took from descriptions and everything else. Before going to war, Montezuma sent ambassadors to neighboring groups of people. He gave these people the option of sending him gifts of gold to avoid battle. If they refused, the emperor prepared his troops for battle. So he kind of gave them a heads up. And many of them, either they didn't have what he wanted to pay, or they just they wanted to try their chances. War was a way of life. Priests determined the dates of the battle. As the day drew near, citizens gathered at the sacred precinct for the battle procession. Many people marched with the warriors. Priests strapped statues of the gods on their backs. Engineers carried materials to build bridges and towers along the way. Young boys carried weapons and supplies. Women and girls cooked and later cared for the injured. When preparing for attack, smoke signals rose from the Aztec camps. These signals announced the appointed day of battle. The Aztecs beat on drums and blew shrill whistles. As the battles of the commanders, commanders, wait, let me go. At the sound of the commander's trumpet, young archers charged into battle. They were armed with bows and opposite tips, arrows. Warriors used a variety of wooden and stone weapons, many edges, many edged with razor sharp pieces of obstinate. That's a that's a type of rock. They threw darts. They hurtled rocks over long distance using slingshots made of fibers for magni cast cactus plants, spears, hatchets, and clubs were all common weapons of battle. Now I want to go back up to the one, two, third sentence. It says the Aztecs beat on drums and blew shrill whistles at the sound of the commander's trumpet. Now, why do you think that they would announce that they were coming? Think about it. If you were on the opposite end, like if you were going to fight against the Aztecs and you're down in your little village and all of a sudden you hear these drums 
and you hear these whistles and then you hear the trumpet. That would kind of scare you. So they were trying to scare you before you even got together to do anything. So it was a type of tactic. They even used it during the Civil War. They, it's referred to as the rebel yell, what the Southerners uh, would do during battle to scare the Union soldiers. So it's, it's not the first time this was used. It's, it's a very good scare tactic. Success on the battlefield was the only way commoners could become nobles. If they captured four prisoners in battle, they were allowed to join one of the elite warrior societies. Of each of these warrior societies named and identified themselves with specific animals. The warriors dressed in the feathers and pelts of the namesake animals. It was easy to spot these warriors in battle, especially the eagles. The eagle warriors wore fancy headdresses with his face peeking out from the eagle's beak. As soldiers advanced in ranks, other costumes became more and more elaborate. So here is an example of an eagle warrior dressed for battle. And up here are some of the weapons that they used. Okay, unrest in the empire. The size of the Aztec army grew with each new conquest. Because the Aztecs outnumbered the other groups, they won nearly every battle. By the time Montezuma II took throne in 1502, the Aztecs had fought numerous battles and made many conquests. The Aztec empire extended from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. The empire, or sorry, the emperor demanded tributes or taxes from all parts of the empire. When he conquered new lands, he allowed local governments to remain in place, but tributes had to be paid. People paid tribute in goods, including cacao, rubber, seashells, cotton, feathers, and precious gems. These goods contributed to Tenochtitlan's wealth and greatness. The emperor's demand created resentment among the conquered city-states. Here, this is the cocoa. This is cotton. And this is some type of feather. It's a pretty feather. By the early 1500s, the Aztecs ruled about 500 smaller city-states and millions of people. Tenochtitlan was the most densely populated city in Mesopotamia. Densely populated means, okay, let's pretend, let's use our playground, and we're going to talk about densely populated. If an area is densely populated, you have on our playground, we have every single student on our playground out here outside the classroom. That's been, it's going to be very difficult to play, isn't it? Because you're going to have people right on top of each other moving around. That is dense okay that is a very densely populated area now a not so densely populated area would be if there was only five classrooms out in the playground you have more room to go so tenochtitlan was very densely populated it had a lot of people in the amount of space that it had and at the time it was one of the largest cities in the world Tenochtitlan, uh, rumors of Tenochtitlan's wealth spread well beyond its boundaries. Flowers, uh, flower wars were fought for blood. This is the sun god. The Aztecs ruled with fear and might. They believed, oh, well, Hutzilo, pocket, uh, Huts. The sun god needed food daily, so they held ceremonies called battles called flower wars in the aztec poetry flower symbolized blood so flower wars were blood wars unlike wars fought over possessions or city states these wars ser served the sole purpose of acquiring sacrificial victims the best warriors dressed in their finest battle clothes fought in these ritual wars some groups avoided the flower wars by paying tributes or taxes to the aztecs I'd be paying up. 
Okay, arrival of Cortez and the Spanish. Hernan Cortez, a Spanish, a Spaniard, was one of the men who heard tales of riches in Mesoamerica. In 1519, he led an expedition from present-day Veracruz on the Gulf of Mexico, seeking gold and power. He stepped ashore. He stepped ashore with about 500 men. They made their way inland on horseback. Cortez and his men fought and conquered powerful Aztec city-states along the way. However, these battles had a strange outcome. Instead of creating enemies, in some cases, the Spaniard gained friends. Some city-states disliked the Aztec Empire so much, they quickly became Cortez's strongest ally. These allies joined Cortez's troops. The size of the Spanish army grew to several thousand men. Together, they marched on to Tenochtitlan. There's an image of Cortez. You probably remember him from the first chapter we read. When Cortez and his men arrived in Tenochtitlan, they were stunned by its elaborate palaces, dazzling Chinapas, uh, Montezuma II, welcomed Cortez and gave him gold and jewels. While the men greeted each other on friendly terms, it appeared the Cortez never intended to be Montezuma II's friend. Cortez left Tenochtitlan determined to conquer the Aztec Empire. He planned to claim the land for the King of Spain. Unpredictable factors made Cortez's task easier. First, some of the Aztec city-states became, became his allies. Second, the Spanish brought deadly European diseases with them. One of Cortez's men was ill with smallpox, and this highly contagious disease spread through the empire. With no immune resistance to the disease and no cure for it, thousands of people died. By August, 8, uh, by August of 1521 CE, over 40,000 Aztecs lay dead. The powerful Aztec empire, which rose out of, up, out of a swamp, was defeated. Now, just real quick, the diseases. This is very similar to what happened when the Spanish came over to North America and with the Native Americans. The Native Americans and the Aztecs in this instance did not have an immune system to combat smallpox. They have never been introduced to it. They've never built up an immune system. Like for us, we get the smallpox vaccine. So we have an immune system that can fight smallpox. Uh, you, you get the chicken, y'all get, we didn't, but y'all get chickenpox shot. I have an immune, immunity to chickenpox because I got it when I was young. So our bodies are constantly gaining immunity. The Native Americans and the Aztecs did not have an immunity to the smallpox at the time. So any little disease that was introduced to their civilization wiped them out. And that's exactly what this did. And that's exactly what helped Cortez be able to take over this area. Aztecs feathered shields. Feather artifacts are rare as they are very fragile and hard to preserve. This extraordinary beautiful shield has lasted hundreds of years. It was once carried into battle by an Aztec warrior. The feathered fringe and tassel hung down to protect the warrior's legs. The feathers on the shield came from a variety of birds commonly in the rainforest of Mesoamerica. They included the yellow oriole, the blue contiga, and the scarlet macaw, and the rosette spoonbill. I think I've only heard about two of those. Scholars think that the blue figure at the center of the shield is a coyote. Like eagles and jaguars, coyotes were symbols of one of the Aztec's elite warrior societies. All right, so that is your story for today and tomorrow. So you need to go in your packet, and you are going to answer your review questions, okay? Just your review questions. You are not... You're not going to answer... I did not give you... Whoop. You'll have a big question on Friday. So what you're going to do, you're going to answer the review questions, and then you're going to do... 
9.4. Review questions and 9.4, we're good. Okay? That's all you have to do. Remember, your review questions must be answered with a complete sentence. And in activity 9.4, you're actually going to be writing complete sentences comparing some information. So, that is all for today. And it's going to take me a minute to get this to click out.